Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. OK, so we're, we're going to record this session and it's going to go on to the, um, the Q Community YouTube channel so people can watch it later. I think there are quite a few people that hope to be with us who, um, who, who are not with us at the minute, but can, can catch up with us soon. So without further ado, I'd really like to introduce to you Katie Rose, who works for the Centre for Public Impact UK, and I think was the programme manager for this particular programme. Um, the Centre for Public Impact teamed up with um, Birds of Britain and Ireland, um, and they were working with social workers, um, redesigning children's social care services, and that was all about prioritising the relationship between social workers and the children that they're working with and their families. Um, the work was about developing a blueprint, um, aiming to show local authorities how they can utilise these new ways of thinking and new ways of working uh, to do their best work. And I have to say, as a registered social worker still, who um, left my frontline job quite a while back now because I was so fed up and frustrated about not being able to make the difference due to the bureaucratisation of my work, I am so excited, Katie, um, that you're here um, and able to tell us about this. So over to you, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so as Jane said, my name's Katie. Um, I'm a program manager at CPI UK. Um, and we at CPI, yeah, work with governments and public sector organizations to help them listen, learn, and adapt better to the complex problems they try to solve. Um, and today I'll talk to you a little bit about, yeah, the, the research trend that we're seeing throughout public services and then the work that we did in social work. So that's my plan. Um, as I said, so we at CPI have been doing a lot of research into the trend that we're seeing that a lot of these webinars are focused on um, that's happening in public administrations around the world um, who are experimenting with different approaches like self-management um, and putting relationships at the heart. And these organisations are radically redefining where power sits and how accountability works. And I think that's why it's really interesting in children's social care, which we'll get on to. Um, so a lot of people will know the organisations that are referenced here, but these are just three examples of organisations that are doing things really differently that were part of the inspiration to our work. Um, so Birds of Britain and Ireland, who we actually worked with um, as part of this project, are obviously doing a lot of things in the, in the Netherlands around um, self-management and enabling decision-making power to sit where it should be, which is at the front line. And I know Brendan was the previous webinar, so you know a lot about that. Um, then in Gateshead um, in the UK, they're doing a lot of stuff around trying to think about how to create public services that are focused on the individual and really support them in the way that they need. And then in Wigan as well, Wigan Council have created what they call the deal, which is um, lots of smaller deals on healthcare, children's social care and community funding, which it basically enables residents to get involved in these activities so that they really share the creation of a better society um, and the Wigan Council have actually said that they'll um, freeze council tax as like part of their deal so it's very much creating different ways to work together that that this blueprint was inspired by. Um, as I said so at CPI UK we've been researching this trend and we've noticed that what is really at the heart and in common with these approaches is the aspect of shared power. It's thinking about locating power at the appropriate place in the system across and beneath it um, and then thinking about how to create the environment for the shared power to create effective and legitimate solutions and what I'll talk to you about today is is you know just in children's social care but we really think this shared power principle that is spreading around the world really gives government a, a kind of um, promising path through the challenges of effectiveness and legitimacy because citizens are expecting results but you know they need to have a relationship with government that is trusted and government needs to stay relevant to them and we really believe that this could present a path through for lots of governments and public sector organizations outside children's social care. So before I talk about the blueprint and the work we did in children's social care and the model that um, we outline. What's really at the heart of these approaches and what I'll present is a shift in mindset. So you can see on the, the left hand side of my slide, um, there's a mindset that exists in a lot of traditional organisations around command and control, which you know means that there's a lot of hierarchy in place, there's a lot of target driven management and um, 
uh, performance management is done through KPIs, etc. It's about what works and thinking about like what's the evidence saying about this place and how do we scale. And then it's about thinking about users and, and making public services about transactions. But what we're seeing is a shift to locating decision making power where it should be, so sub subsidiarity. A focus on relationships and thinking about how to personalize public services and how to put those relationships with the people that really are working with them like social workers in the context I'll talk to you about and children and families because that is where real work happens and that's where like lives can be really changed. It's also about continuous learning so using data for continuous learning and the enablement of learning rather than performance management and it's about redefining governance and that's really important when i talk about the blueprint that we created because it's about going from uh, managing to supporting and to enabling and that's really at the heart of what we try to do so as i said we worked um, with a lot of different frontline professionals as part of this research. And we kept coming across social workers that were telling us how much this was a reality, this command and control, control culture was a reality for them in their work. And it was really getting in the way for them and preventing them from doing the best work with children and families. So we heard from social workers that the work was too bureaucratic, so there was lots of processes and internal management processes and recording that needed to be done that didn't feel like it was benefiting children and families. There was also, and this is a great phrase that I heard um, from one of the team managers we worked with that I have stolen, um, which he's given me, <laughs> uh, which is there, there were too many eyes and not enough hands. There wasn't enough people doing the work. Um, one in three um, practice, you know, trained social workers in the work in local authorities are in management positions, not working directly with children and families. And I think to a lot of the social workers that were under a lot of caseload pressure, that felt like there was just too many people watching their decisions and not enough people working with children and families and reducing that caseload. And then lastly, as I said, you know, they really spoke about this command and control culture that was creating an excessive focus on data that was needed to navigate management and bureaucracy, but not actually help children and families. So I think we, we kind of saw that this trend that I talked about, this shift that we talked about from command and control to enablement could really benefit social workers and children and families because we were hearing a lot of the problems that exist in the old world that was getting in their way. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to come up with a realistic way for a local authority to do children's social care differently that prioritise relationships with families at no additional cost and that would comply with existing regulation and legislation. So we partnered with um, Frontline, who are a social work charity and they recruit um, graduates into social work and Burtzog Britain and Ireland, because obviously Burtzog had um, a lot of experience in creating success in healthcare in the Netherlands and revolutionizing that using this shift from command and control to what they call servant support or what we call um, you know, the shared power principle. So to do this, we wanted social workers to be at the heart of the approach because we didn't want to manage them, <laughs> which was exactly uh, how they felt in the system already. So we worked with over 100 social workers and um, practice leaders in the sector. Um, and we also wanted to talk to a lot of um, innovative practice that has happened in the sector already, because there are a lot of local authorities that were trying different approaches to remove some of these barriers that social workers told us was the case. So for instance, Hackney, Leeds, and you can see some of the logos in the top right box there. We also wanted to talk to a lot of the professionals in the social care sector, so Ofsted, Baswa, um, who are the British Association of Social Workers, and um, the Family Rights Group, who obviously have an insight into how children and families feel about the system, so that we would really learn how to create the, the best system for social workers and children and families. And we also looked into a lot of the approaches that um, Guys and St Thomas's and other organisations in the bottom right hand box had been piloting around self-management and around creating this enablement culture. So we wanted to take all that learning and create something that would be a realistic way for a local authority to do their children's social care differently. 
And then before I get into the model, it's important to say that we wanted principles and values to be at the heart of this, which is the title of my webinar. Um, the two values and principles that we wanted to be at the heart of this were actually came up came up by the social workers we worked with. So it's about meaningful relationships with children and families because they are the enablers of good social work. And that is proven by lots of different research studies. Social workers know it to be true and the children and families that we spoke to as part of this, but also their representatives that we spoke to know that to be the case. So that has to be something we solve for, for any system that, that we think about putting in place. And the second principle is around where decision making rights sit. So that subsidiarity that I talked about earlier. Social workers felt that they should be given the responsibility to make meaningful decisions with families because we heard a lot of stories about them not being able to, you know, get even ten pounds to get a train ticket for, for their, you know, um, young person they were working with to go to something that they thought would benefit their journey, and that seemed crazy to everyone in the system. So we wanted to create a a system that decision making power sat at the right place and right now it feel it felt to a lot of people that it, it wasn't so those were the two things we were trying to, to solve for in, in our um, approach so at the center of this model I'll talk you through now what the model looks like and, and then we can cover some of the benefits and I'd love to hear um, any reflections at the center of this model are patched based family facing teams of practitioners who all work with families and with children. So former team managers that are currently not right now in management positions are sitting within these teams holding cases and working with children and families. The biggest change about what this model in the blueprint outlines is where decision making rights sit. So the majority of decision making rights sit with the social worker that is working with the child and the family. They are patched based, as I said, so they work in a geographic patch, and this allows the team to create community links and understand local services that are available to them. Something that social workers said, you know, being so spread out and taking so much time to travel between visits was actually disabled by the current system. So we think that by creating a patched based model, that might enable them to use the resources at their at their dispense. T um, social workers hold cases of all level of risk. So right now, a key um, prohibitor in a relationship between a social worker and a family is often a child when they move through the levels of risk. So from assessment to from initial assessment to being a child in need to being a child looked after, they get moved to a different social worker. And we've defined those, we've defined them as that. So we've categorized a child as child in need to being a child looked after when it's the same child and they need the relationship with the social worker that has helped them so far to be sustained. And that was something that social workers really felt was a prohibitor to actually producing good outcomes for children and families. The other thing to say is that, you know, this is where we were very inspired by Bert Zog specifically. There is no manager in this team. So the teams are self-managed and they hold a budget so they can give and allocate budget as they see fit. So that situation that I talked about earlier, which came up a lot when we spoke to social workers about not having a tiny amount of money to make a decision wouldn't be the case now that the team would be able to move budget around and give and you know a social worker would be able to make that decision and therefore sustain this relationship they've spent time building up and lastly oversight and supervision which is obviously a huge thing in social work would be provided not by the manager right now as it is right now which is one-to-one -one and um Often a manager has 10 social workers who so have to spread themselves quite thinly. It would be provided by the team and through peer supervision, which is again what um, Bertzog in the Netherlands has, has piloted and tried. And it seems to be a very supportive model, which actually allows more time for reflection and supervision rather than less. So these teams are at the heart of the model that we present in the blueprint. And around them sits a support structure just to enable them to do their best work. And that is the point of it. So the rest of the system is set up to support social workers. And you can see um, the kind of uh, 
organogram looks like what I've got on the left. So it's not very hierarchical. It's actually centered around children and families. Then you have the family facing teams, which are the pink dots. And then you've got the other four teams that you can see there in purple, blue, pink and orange that support these social workers to do their best job. And so the four teams are a referral team, which allocates when a case is when a, a child is referred to social services it allocates that child to the family facing teams based on geographic patch there's the enabler team that you can see in purple there whose job it is to help teams run effectively and efficiently so doing a lot of the hr the business support the administration that needs to happen to help to make a self-managed team work and i'm sure you heard a lot of that from the Burtzog system in the in the previous webinar Thirdly is the insight team, um, and they exist to help uh, case holding social workers do their best practice with families. So they are the independent experienced voice that they can go to for that external supervision if they feel like they need it. But it's very much a, a um, pull in function rather than a management function like it used to be. And for those of you that are in social work, they, these would be the um, principal social workers that exist right now to be able to offer that that chance to reflect on decisions and make sure you're making good ones. And then fourthly is the strategy team. And this is where, this is definitely a diversion away from what Burtzog do. Because we spoke to a lot of social workers and leaders and they did feel that there needed to be an extra check and balance on those decisions that were most important to children and families' lives. For instance, being, um, you know, in kind of initiating care proceedings or initiating court proceedings or change of placement for a child. And there was, it was felt that there needed to be that extra check and balance, which the strategy team provide. But those decision rights are very, very clearly defined as you know the, the, the three or four that I, I um, listed and outlined more so in the blueprint. So that social workers are clear on the decision rights they hold and the decision rights they need to seek an external check and balance. It's also the strategy team's job to preserve the culture that is so important to making this work, which is about trust and about enablement. And that's their job. And they are also managers of any senior engagement with the local authority or with other partners and agencies, because we appreciate if a local authority is going to do this, they will still work within a quite hierarchical world where, for instance, the police force might feel they need a senior leadership team to manage a more senior relationship. So this is, this is um, a solution to that. But I think what's so important to say about the strategy team, because I do, you know, they're the only team that hold decision rights in this model, apart from social workers in the family facing teams, are the way that they work with social workers is very different. So right now, social workers have, have told us that they, you know, they have to go through many panels, they have to go present their decisions to leadership to get them to be signed off. And what we suggest in the blueprint and what social workers told us might be better is actually the strategy team going to the family facing team to find out about the decision context and about the decision that's being made. So you just flip the whole hierarchy of the system from looking up to looking at the social workers and the family facing teams. So that is the model that we outline in the blueprint and there's a lot more um, information than I than I'll cover today about the minutiae of how you work with agencies and partners um, and you know the decision rights that, that we propose for the strategy team um, but there are kind of fundamental changes to decision rights as I said that now sit with the majority sit with social workers whereas right now we the local authorities that, that we've researched um, and the social workers we've spoken to said that's just not the case Accountability also changes, so everyone becomes accountable to children and families, not to their initial line manager. That's a very different type of accountability. It's no longer vertical and looking up, as I said, it's looking very much at the child and family. Oversight and supervision changes. Um, this is a peer model of oversight and supervision and not a managerial model of one. That does not mean, however, that it's not valued in the system or that less would be provided. I'll actually show you that more can be provided um, on the next slide. And reporting and the nature of reporting really changes in this model because you're no longer writing a lot of case notes for your manager. You are making notes and reporting what you need to develop the best relationship with 
with the child or the family you're working with record it for them because they need to know their history you know in social work um children often look back at their social care journey and they understand a lot about who they are and how they've got to where they are and it's so important that that information is kept but the purpose of reporting fundamentally changes because you're not reporting up you're reporting for the child and family so then we wanted to check that um this model you know we we felt like it it could really offer really promising results for social workers that work in the system and children and families and the social workers we worked with were so excited about it and you know helped us i mean I, i'm taking credit for it even in this webinar but it's really them and we worked really closely with 10 of them uh, four of them actually wrote the blueprint with me so physically wrote which was quite fun um, and yeah it, it really was their idea um, but we wanted to check that this would have as many benefits as we thought it would so what we did was we um, modeled an existing local authorities system and what it would look like if it transitioned to the system that we propose in the blueprint and we found that there would be five key benefits if you did transition your system to what we present in the blueprint. So, as I said, the social workers we spoke to felt that they would be able to maintain more consistent relationships with children and families because the child is not being moved depending on their level of risk. The social worker is holding them through all levels of risk and they would be able to have more time to spend um, with children and families. And when actually we did the time calculation, because you would reduce a lot of bureaucracy and reporting up that currently exists, as well as a lot of the internal processes, we actually found that you could increase time to families by 60%. So you'll see on the slide there, it's increasing it from 16% to 25%, which doesn't seem that much, but it is 60%. And it, this is still complying with all of the external regulation and legislation that requires so much time from social workers. And if, if they had their way from what we heard, a lot of that would be reduced, but we wanted to present a model that could be done tomorrow. And it, you would still see a 60% increase in time spent with children and families or potential time spent. The third benefit is you would see a reduction in caseloads. So by 21% we actually found. So right now, um, on average, uh, with the local authority we worked with, social workers were holding 15.5 cases. Because you are converting a lot of team managers into practicing um, social workers, that would go down to 12.2. So there would be a 21% reduction, which is actually the biggest reason that social workers leave the system is through stress. I mean, Jane talked a bit about it earlier, through stress and feeling a burden of caseloads and that uh, massively explodes in a lot of local authorities. So we, that was something that we really wanted to check wouldn't explode in the system. And actually, we found that it would be a big reduction. Fourthly, quality assurance. So a concern with this model, because there is no manager, might be that there is not the quality assurance that you might need. But because of the amount of time you would save, reducing your time between visits because you're being patched based and because you're not navigating a big bureaucracy, there is actually 46% more time you can spend in um, meetings and in supervision, so in team meetings. And the blueprint outlines a framework that you know team meetings would have so for instance you have to talk about cases each month to make sure that social workers are reflecting on their decisions and good decisions are being made lastly and i think this was one that i didn't think about so much but social workers really valued was that experience in these teams would massively increase so again by 21 percent so that's average years of experience in a team and that's because, again, you're converting previously for team managers who have moved out of practice because that's the career development path that is presented in social work. You're a practicing social worker, then you move into management, then you move into leadership. But our model obviously suggests a very different career path. And it's similar, you know, and again, I'm stealing a quote from one of the social workers. They said, you know, in dentistry or in, um, when you're a doctor, you don't stop when you get more experienced. And social work is unique like that that unfortunately we've got these amazing social workers that are so experienced not working directly with children and families. But in our model, that's not true. So you would actually increase the amount of experience in the team, which obviously then also presents a lot of learning opportunities for those newly qualified social workers 
They get to see their, their previous managers working directly with cases and reflecting on them so that they would learn. And this was actually something that the social workers we worked with were probably one of the most excited by. And again, I might not have thought that to, to be true, but it, it really was. I think they saw a real potential for learning and development there. So then, I mean, the three kind of outcomes that we would expect a system like this to produce is better, to, better outcomes for children and families, which is obviously the most important thing, because those relationships can be nurtured and time can be spent doing so. We would hope it would increase staff satisfaction and retention because caseloads would be less, because social workers are getting to do what they went into the job to do, which is work with children and families, not navigate bureaucracy. And we think it'd be more, well, it would be a more effective use of public resources because you've got more people working with children and families and your system is structured around them and for them, not to report to management and not to serve itself. So that's the system we propose and how to restructure it. But just before I end, and I, I know Brendan made the point last week about this, I think what is so important to making this work is, you know, this isn't just a system reshuffle. It really is about creating a culture of trust and shared power. And that is at the heart of the shared power principle that I talked about earlier. And what we see is in common with the approaches that are spreading around the world. And that is absolutely at the heart of this. Because if you don't trust your social workers to make good decisions, you can't locate decision making power with them. But right now there is a, a culture of mistrust of social workers that we heard from them. And it feels awful and it undermines their decision making capability and their confidence in their ability to do so and I think this is about creating a culture of trust and and sharing power and really creating um, you know a culture of freedom and responsibility and it sits with those leaders that currently right now have decision making power and it is definitely a challenge in children's social care but the great thing about it is it, it, it's presenting a system and a culture that is enabling and supportive um, and really about children and families. So that's why I think it's, it's gained so much traction in the sector. So lastly, before um, we reflect and, and take any questions, I just wanted to say what our next steps are. So we're working with a lot of um, local authorities to make this a reality. And I'd really encourage anyone that's in social work that's on the line to get in contact with us because we're creating uh, a network of those that are really making the shared power principle a reality. So get in touch with me, my, my email's there. Um, and you can download the blueprint as well. So for more information on what I talked about. Um, it's worth saying as well, we also have created a really fast growing community of practice. So for those just in, in children's social care um, that want to just stay in touch with a lot of these ideas and how it's growing in the sector, um, there's a link there to the community of practice. But anyone else I think that's interested outside of the sector, do get in touch because this is really spreading and we're really keen to support any um, government or public sector entity that wants to make it a reality. And it seems really like it's taking off. So it's super exciting. That's it for me. Sorry, I've spoken a bit long. I hope it's okay. That was great, Katie. Thank you very much. I wonder, um, do you mind unsharing your slides? Yeah, of course. A few more people might appear on the screen and we can see each other. So I think we've got about um, 23, 25 people um, on the call. Um, and I'm aware that we've got some people on the phone who, of course, can't see what's going on either. So um, I don't even know who's on the phone, Matthew, but I'm going to just sort of say if you're on the phone and you've got a question to ask, we'll let you go first. Are, are there any questions from people on the phone? You'll need to unmute, you'll need to unmute yourselves. Or should I? Okay, I'm gonna. Well, I, I can see a couple of people. I'm not. I'm not seeing any um, flashing green squares that might suggest they're trying to talk. So let's open it out a bit further. So, are there any questions from people um, hearing what what Katie's spoken about? And if not, I've I've got a few I can start us off with. I've got a question. Brilliant, Claire. What's your question? Um, so I'm really interested in the self-managed teams um, model that you've shared, Katie. It sounds really great work actually so well done 
um, at you and the social work team. Sounds fantastic. Um, I'm I, I work in children's health, so uh, not in social work, but um, in a health organisation, which, as you know, is traditionally very hierarchical in structure um, and with different levels of professional um, skills and ability as well. Um, I was interested, I had a few questions actually, and I, I don't know, um, well, I've written them down and I'm not on my screen now, but one of the things that I was interested in is within the immediate family facing team that you've got, mm. you talked about um, historically we, we would um, group children you know by category so looked after children or children with disabilities or you know different different groups and of course we have the same issue in health and um i i it was great to see your supporting structures and everything around that team but i wondered if within the team do you did how do you navigate the specialisms that are required to to really understand how to work most effectively with a looked after child as opposed to let's say a, a child with complex needs you know mm -hmm. how, how, how do the team have different roles and responsibilities within that that, that inner sanctum yeah maybe i'll take that one first and then you can ask and anything yeah. else um so something that we outline is that you're right to do this make sure you're okay all different types of need you would need the team to have a mix of specialisms yeah. so you'd need to make sure that, that expertise accessible in the team um and i appreciate that that you know that it might that might sound scary in the sense that you're not having these specialist um categories of, of social workers working with with children but i think because you've got that expertise accessible a you learn how to then access it and work with different categories of risk and um, children at different in different categories of risk and also I think what excited the social workers we spoke to is is that it, it always felt odd to them to pass on a child to a different yeah no no I mean no, it, it, there isn't we we have specialisms yeah um, and a, a real downside is that you lose continuity of care yeah um, so and also and then i think I you suppose also you've got more supervision as well haven't you so if you've got more supervision and the person with the specialist skills can can support yeah, the others exactly and and one of the things we talked about with them was because teams get um referrals from the referral team they can allocate cases within their team so if, for instance okay. if you've got someone that is more experienced in lots of different specialisms it would be perfectly okay to give them less cases to be able to support others it's just yeah. the decision making rights to do that sit within the team. It's not okay. with a manager anymore that just allocates cases. And that's why um, we heard often that cases explode and explode. Yeah, well. yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. See, that, that's really helpful. I'm, um, I'm just going to invite Eileen as well to, to ask her question here. She's, I think she's asking about outcomes for children. Do you want to explain that a little bit more, Eileen? Yeah, hi Katie, brilliant presentation and I got an opportunity to look at the blueprint before today as well. So um, really interested in looking at the benefits of this model and um, on your slide there you had highlighted one of the benefits being that you were able to see better outcomes for children through the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know a bit more about how you measure that. Yeah, it's a great question. So to be clear on what we did for the blueprint, we did a, a modelling exercise to see what potential benefits would be. But we're working currently with local authorities to work out how to measure those outcomes in this model. So that is actually a work in progress. So just to be clear about, um, yeah, just to be just a clarification on that. Um, we would we would hope it would create better outcomes for children and families, because a lot of the research shows that when you enable relationships, it then gives you know social workers the chance and the ability to be able to work with children and families over time but that is definitely something that in our work with local authorities we're thinking about how you might measure that because a lot of the measurements as well this is something a little bit outside the blueprint but what we're hearing from local authorities is that a lot of the measurements that are used are quite crude so you know that yeah. it's spent it's mm -hmm. uh, visits done number of visits mm -hmm. etc 
Mm -hmm. So I think there's a really interesting challenge that we are trying to work out in each local authority context of like what you would actually want to see grow, mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely something you would need to to do this to then think about really carefully for the context. And that's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, we have similar challenges here in Northern Ireland where a lot of our measurement is about activity um, mm. rather than the outcomes, and particularly um, an outcome that's been enhanced by a relationship. Yeah, that would be really interesting if you do manage to. Yeah, I'll send you. We have quite a lot of. Um, we've done quite a lot of thinking on this, so I'll send you some stuff if you. Yeah, that would yeah, be really good. Thanks. Drop Kim. me an email, and I'll send you because we've. Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, and if you visit the CPO website, but I can I can point you to a lot of it. Oh. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm thinking that this might also link to the Toby Lowe webinar that we've got planned for, is it May, Matthew? Yeah. 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 And, and so actually, yeah, so we've done a lot of, um, we've spoken to Toby quite a lot about this question. I think it's definitely something that when you're thinking about, you know, system thinking and complexity is, is a big thing that to move away from KPIs and performance measurement feels scary unless you have create an alternative so it's definitely something that mm -hmm. that, you, that we would need to think about brilliant thank you okay. um so there's a question from laura um asking to know um about how you've worked with health providers so i assume this is health providers and social workers working together is it laura that you're thinking of here oh yeah yeah can, can you hear me yes we can yeah. great um yeah so really um, i was more thinking about um so claire kind of already covered part of that off but i was thinking particularly um around like the statutory requirements that we have around initial health assessments and review health assessments and i know that takes us back to sort of the old um kpi and activity measures rather than uh the, the approach and the outcomes that you're talking about here but ultimately they are statutory requirements and mm. we're quite we are looking here at you know like you're saying how we um so i work in a ccg and a local authority across both for commissioning um mm -hmm. how we kind of develop this more uh locality based place-based working and i'd be really keen to know if there was any consideration about how health comes into the model that you've already discussed today yeah so i i so in the model so we to, to address what you said about existing kind of regulation legislation so we for this we worked we consulted Ofsted a lot at the beginning and tried to work out what some of the boundaries were for them um to creating any you know um uh, cutting of processes or management and actually what we found in in social care which was really interesting I don't know if this is the case um in in your local authority or, or where you work but in a lot of local authorities there's quite a lot of myth busting to be done around what processes are just within a local authority and what are Ofsted required um, so that was quite interesting to find out because a lot of the um, regulation legislation had come in from a local authority in a local authority history point of view so came from that so it was actually easier than than a lot of the leaders that we worked with might have thought to cut it um, on on what you said about um, relating this to health, we do outline in the blueprint some ways that these family facing teams would work with agencies, so health agencies. Um, and we think the reason I didn't cover it now and the reason um, it's not central to the kind of um, core model that we present is because it's so dependent on the existing relationships between healthcare agencies that local authorities mm. hold. Mm. Um, so we didn't want to generalize because you know some some have a um, you know a MASH, a multi-agency um, service hub, others have different ways of working with agencies. But I think the the lessons that we learned from going through this process would be trying to involve them as early as possible to let them know the changes that you're making because otherwise you'll just surprise them and and you know there'll, there'll be no team manager to call upon it will just be a family facing team and if you're working with um, very hierarchical agencies we presented the fact that the strategy team could still hold that senior relationship but would also be very much accountable to trying to make the relationship as as almost supportive for the social worker as possible because again we were hearing from social workers that health agencies were kind of navigating above them and talking to their team manager and they didn't have exposure to that yeah 
Um, so that was something we were also trying to, to change with this model. That's really helpful, thank you. No worries. Thanks, Katie. There's a, a great question from Stuart Black here around the, the greatest challenge in getting local authorities to embrace this, this way of thinking, this way of working, and the role of elected members here. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. I saw it pop up. Um, we, so as I'm sure many of the people on the line know, um, working with any local authority to make this kind of change requires, it seems to me, is requiring an enormous amount of stakeholders, um, including elected members. So um, the local authorities that we're working with are speaking to their elected members about um, doing this change and I think it's a it, it, it's almost convincing them that decision-making power should sit with them on this which is quite interesting um, because if, if these, these people have experience in running a system and they think that this has benefits then they are asking their elected members to trust them so almost the culture of trust is trying to grow upwards as well as in the system um, I think a lot, I mean, I can, I, I can talk to you about, well, I can talk to you about my individual reflections about how that's going. <laughs> um, but is your, I assume, is your question more about how- uh, To my question. Um, it was really, I was really interested about the, cat, the catalyst to, to um, um, initiate, um, you know, a, a culture change like this. And what mm -hmm. I was actually thinking about was the role of elected members to put pressure on the officers to say we need to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'd like to see elected members do. And I don't see it very often, but I, I think that's what they're elected for, to, go, to show leadership. Yeah. Um, that, that, that was what was behind my thinking. What, what I, yeah, I think you're exactly right. I, I think you're exactly right. This needs to be championed by leadership to work because that leadership needs to show that they are willing to share power, which is why we call it that, um, and also create a culture of trust, and that has to come from the top. Um, I think... Yeah, I would just second what you said, really. I mean, I, from my reflections on the Conservative government is they're looking to do big changes. And I think this could present a interesting path through, despite it not being aligned with any party politics, um, because it's about effective use of public resources, not about efficiency. And it's about the enablement of social workers. But I think my reflections on, um, you know, their manifesto, etc., could, it could present a interesting path through. Okay, thank you. I'm um, I'm just looking at several questions here and thinking that there's something around um, levels of supervision and, and the learning practices and the, the peer supervision emerging out of, of, of several questions in this thread, Katie. Could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, so supervision and oversight was something that when we spoke to both social workers and team managers and anyone in leadership positions was the first thing that they brought up. Um, because obviously right now the system is structured to oversee and to manage um, and to supervise because there's you know one in three uh, social workers that are trained on in practice they're in management so there's a lot of um, eyes on decisions I think what we wanted to change was we wanted to change how supervision and oversight worked not how much was provided because we heard from social workers directly that that was the most valuable thing in their manager we wanted to understand what was really valuable in the management system right now and we heard from them that it was about reflective supervision and the ability to reflect on your decisions talk about them retrospectively but also as they're going on so the reason we structured the family facing teams as we did was to um, have enough social workers, so there's eight um, that we propose in these teams, have enough that you would allow for different voices and different reflections on your decisions and also enable them because of the time savings from traveling between visits and not navigating bureaucracy to be able to spend more time in team meetings, which is what we had from social workers was so valuable. So that's the first point. I think the second point was that we really appreciated that there could be a danger here of groupthink. So you could have a very influential person in a team that then convinces everyone of their decisions and then you've got a bit of groupthink going on. So we wanted to have an uh, experienced advice source outside of the team to be able to be draw drawn upon. And that is the insight team. That is their main purpose to not 
provide oversight, like not provide supervision in the managerialist sense, but provide oversight and, and just advice really on case matters. And actually, I think a lot of social workers do seek that a lot of the time. There's kind of this impression, or well, we heard from them, there's an impression that if they got decision making rights, they would just run away with it and just run away and make loads of decisions. And actually, the, the, like the vast, vast majority that we spoke to, pretty much all of them, I can't think of anyone that said that they would seek outside source less. So I actually think it's an interesting, um, it's almost like you, we should give them trust to see what to see what would happen, because I don't think it would be as bad as a lot of people worry about. And then the third thing I just want to say on that, because it's really interesting, is again, I'm, I'm using a phrase here that one of the social workers used, but they kept saying that the system right now is designed for exceptions. So for, the, for those for almost those weaker social workers and those social workers that are lone wolves that do run off with decisions that don't seek, you know, um, reflection and that might be in it for the wrong reasons. And the system right now is structured around them to stop them, to prohibit them from doing bad things, which is obviously really important. But because it's structured like that, it's disabling the majority of social workers that are amazing and team managers kept saying that to us that the majority of social workers are brilliant but the system right now disables them and takes away their decision making power and their confidence in their ability to make decisions so what we've tried to design is a system around the really really good majority whilst making sure that in the minority of cases where something really serious will happen that is accounted for and you know serious case reviews and everything like that will stay the same in this model just to be clear um but i think the system right now is disabling so much that we need to enable jane i think you're on mute i can't hear you thank you yeah sorry thank you katie but just to remind people we discussed it earlier if you if you're looking for the chat box if you slide your cursor down to the bottom of the screen you should find a little speech bubble thing with chat and you'll be able to see all of the questions coming up um i've also noticed that matt bell is with us um, who we thought can join us so welcome matt and matt has very kindly um pasted the link to the toby low zoom which is due in may so you can register there in the chat box um and I'm aware that Brendan is with us and can't find the chat box. So Brendan, what was your question that you wanted to ask? Brendan Martin, can you, can you unmute yourself? I could find the chat box. I just wasn't sure that um, that was the right way to ask a question. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Matt. I can hear you, Brendan. Yes. Yeah. What's your question? Okay. Um, well, it's not a question really. It's, it's more, more of a comment. Um, um, there's a lot of, of what Katie said that I recognise, and a quite a lot that I don't. Uh, but this this project actually grew out of um, uh, work that we did with Frontline last year to to support um, their their thinking about how uh, social children's social work could change and be influenced by by the Bjorkson approach. And so we we began some work to to explore that and took a study visit of uh, some of Frontline's fellows and system leaders to the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, as Katie said, um, did some, um, provided some advice to the Blueprint. Um, uh, the, the reason that uh, CPI were involved in this was that uh, Frontline had uh, support from the Boston Consulting Group, which also funds the CPI, and, and therefore was able to contribute some considerable resource. And I think the the outcome was a tremendous job of research and analysis about the challenges in social work. My worry with it, though, is that the idea of a, a national level blueprint, I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable with. Um, and, and the idea that we can solve the challenges that are expressed in the description of the problems in children's social care with an organizational redesign, I think is fundamentally wrong. The, the starting point must be for local authority leaders to think about and, and explore what is their purpose and the purpose of this very important service and to engage with the people that they employ, the social workers they actually employ, and the people that those social workers support to explore how to do things differently. And I think the danger with imposing a, a nationally developed model 
on that is that that very important process of discovery, of learning, of building shared purpose and creating solutions where they need to be created could be lost. So while I think it's a very useful piece of work and we were very glad to contribute to it, I think it's important also not to think that we can leap to an organizational redesign without really doing a lot of engagement work with leaders of local authorities, leaders of children's services, and with the people they employ and the people they support. So that's, that's my question. It's not, it's not a question. I said at the outset that it wasn't, but it is a point I think it's very important to make. Thanks, okay, thanks thank for letting you. me yeah. make it. Thank you, thank uh, well, you. Let, let, me, let me respond to that, because I, I think I just second it. And I think we make clear in the blueprint, for sure, that what we're trying to present here is a principle-led way that you might think about the system differently. And I think we make clear in parts of what we wrote, Brendan, that um, any local authority that wants to do this needs to think about how it would work in their context. And we wanted to come up with some ways that you know they might, and we wanted to listen to the social workers that we worked with and make sure that their voices were being heard when they said they might need you know, an, uh, an insight team or an enabler team. But you're right, in any pilot this is doing, and that's that's 100% our approach, we're starting with the local context and thinking about how this might work for them. Um, because obviously the you know, the risk profiles and everything is also in the local authority. So we're really, yeah, I, I just have your point really. Um, but but what, if, if I may just come back briefly, because the, the what, what we've really learned in the 25 or 30 organizations that we've worked in in Britain, including some of those that you mentioned earlier, is that um, unless there is a really strong commitment, build that commitment amongst, amongst organizational leadership, eventually the challenges of testing and learning of organizational change come, come up against that. And so we're very strongly of the view that it's not just a question of looking for local solutions, but it's really building. Before you can think about the organizational redesign, you really have to work on the purpose, the values, and the vision itself. And that's, that's where, you know, frankly, that's where CPI and we have found it difficult to work together, because that for us is so fundamental that we wouldn't want to jump in and, and say, well, here's your blueprint for how to do children's social care differently. What we do want to do is explore with organizational leaders what their purpose is, how they see the future, who they need to engage with in, in their local area to, and in, in their own organization to find solutions. And that can't be done in a few weeks. That's, that's a big project and it needs time. For sure. I, 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 yeah, I second your point. I think we just wanted to present what a system designed by social workers would look like. That was always our intention. So I think what we might have stumbled on here is um, a, a, another great subject for um, conversation around um, the different approaches and the different stances perhaps that, that people are taking um, in response to taking this agenda forward. Um, and Matthew, and, and Matt and I will um, definitely note that and maybe try and convene sort of um, some sort of conversation around that because I think it, it has places to go. I am acutely aware of the time um, and that um, most people on this call um, have probably managed to escape other things that they should be doing to be with us and I'm really really grateful for that and I don't want to um, take the conversation beyond the point um, where people have to go and, and, and are going to miss something important. I'm aware on the chat thread that there's various requests for um, us to repost links to various documents and things and, and we'll do that. Um, and uh, that there are some outstanding questions there as well. I think what usually happens, Matthew, is that um, we email everybody who's registered um, for the webinar with links to the recording and various links to the, um, the documents and, and, and other things that we've mentioned during our conversation. Um, so I'm going to say thank you very, very much to, to Katie um, for giving up her time and, and uh, making the efforts to, to do this for us. 
thank you for everybody who's joined us on the phone and on video. Um, and I'm really, really sorry for those of you who haven't had a chance to have your questions discussed. Um, but hopefully we can create another space to pursue this conversation further. Have Thanks, I missed everyone. anything, Matthew? Sorry, did you say something, Jane? I missed I that. Said, have, I, have I missed anything? I'm just checking. I don't think so. Um, just look out for the recording um, on, on YouTube, but we'll share a link and um, you know the blueprint link and, and various things, any other resources. Um, I know there's been coverage as well of the blueprint. We might want to link to, to some of that possibly as well. Yeah. Um, and, and do anyone contact me if you have any other questions, or I'm really happy to speak to anyone in or outside of children's social care. Thank yes. you. And it sounds like if you have a, a local authority that's, that might be keen to get involved. Um, yeah, join us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.